past 60 years has been a massive decline in foreign missions. I'm sharing the gospel through church planting. In the 1930s, if somebody gave $10 in Thai, they'd give an additional $6 in foreign missions. Today, just 28 cents. We're doing the best we can with what we have, but I'm still not satisfied. Over two billion people in the world today still have no access to the gospel. God's crazy in love with the Thai people, and I sense His Spirit hovering over the city. I've come to Bangkok, Thailand to discover the truth about foreign missions. Come with me as I follow my good friend, Pastor Doug Van, in his everyday life as a frontline missionary. I prayed for God's biggest dream, and He gave me this city of 12 million. Welcome to my world. We're here at the, one of the Bangkok churches and uh, in preparation for this week of evangelism. Uh, and so all week long, our student missionary team working with uh, this church has been working hard to set up the, the set as well as then getting the, uh, the challenges of the technical stuff. Uh, my student missionary, Andrew, uh, just uh, reported to me that we've got challenges with audio, with the video, and with all these other things and so we uh, this uh, morning we had a chance to pray and to you know try to seek God for the solutions because right now uh, he was telling me that we can't we can't do it this evangelistic series is one of several planned to be held in different places around the city simultaneously we have to use this other because the Miller plate won't work. At this location, the message will be translated into the Karen language to benefit the minority people group known as the Karen, whose homeland is in Burma. Our list of things to fix. We are still working on audio. The composition, I'll work on while you guys are gone. And then, what else was there? We got the books for Shannon. We got, uh, you wanted to move the cameras. Okay, so both of them, okay, they're there. Then the other thing is that you wanted, uh, perhaps we might need tape. Yeah, are, are we using videotape? Yeah. Okay, so it might be helpful to have some videotape. So, okay, we need to go now. Hey, let's get this bike. Yeah, th those are the wheels that I brought over here. <laughs> no, I'll take that home. You can take the car. Well, we're on our way to go and try to work some technical uh, challenges out. I've been told by some of our Thai leaders that our city here, it's been over 30 years since we've had kind of this citywide evangelistic thrust. And it's because of the fact that we're in a, a Buddhist country that these the normal kind of uh, methods of using uh, a public reaping meeting or a public evangelistic meeting, uh, although they have their place, they're not effective in reaching people who, <laughs> who don't even know who Jesus is. So let alone, you know, talking about what he's doing now, the fact he's coming back, and all the hope that, he, that uh, we as Christians have. For, for a Buddhist, to even understand what we're talking about, that is just, they don't even have the same vocabulary. Uh, when, when we describe words like sin, um, or merit, or salvation, th these terms are, they come from a worldview that is completely different than uh, the Christian worldview. And so as a result, they may walk away from a presentation of a Bible teaching that is, um, you know, we as the presenter or we as the communicators may think that we have communicated clearly, but in reality, they have just been reinforced in their, in their works-based uh, faith. It's like trying to explain snow to them. You know, snow is cold. Uh, and it snow it falls down from the sky. These are all intellectual concepts for the ties. Where, you know, what does it feel like to pick up snow, to taste it, and then to 
pack it into a into a ball and then to throw it or to have that impact your face you know these are intellectual concepts that those here in, in this part of the world uh, they they understand but they have no experience no reference point and so it is with Christianity and trying to explain that to them is that they have no reference point. It's like we're, we're speaking an alien language uh, to the Thais. And that's one, a lot of people don't understand that, that to even take a simple concept of let's say uh, forgiveness the Bible says that uh, though your sins be as scarlet and they shall be as white as wool though they be uh, red like crimson they shall be as snow um, this reference point uh, of snow they have it's never snowed here in Thailand and so that alone makes communicating the gospel uh, a challenge that we have to be able to overcome and this is one reason why um, you know sometimes you know what do you say what do you say and that's where I've tried to be really like a student of the culture uh, and you know encourage the church planters here to you know listen and to to read the culture and read what's you know what's going on in society and history and literature so that way they can uh, appropriately uh, communicate the essence and the the meaning of the gospel in ways that the ties or their audience uh, will understand and are we doing a good job with that I don't know I uh, I pray and I know that uh, God's Spirit is working across the city and that uh, we do the best we can for his glory I love how you set up the set, so it's a good job. So I don't know. That was okay. too. That was both of us. Okay, yay, good job. So when I took you up to Biot Sky uh, Tower and you had a chance to see how big the city is, um, what were your feelings? How immense the city is. Yeah. It's huge. Nearly 12 million people live in Bangkok. But what does that mean? How do you wrap your mind around a number that big? Think of it this way, if the 1,200 Adventists that live in Bangkok were to share the gospel with one new person every day, it would take nearly 30 years to reach everyone in the city. This is just one city. This is one city. It's our city. I mean, it's now your adopted city for this time that you're here. But to share the gospel here, uh, you know, there are many Christians around the world who think that Everyone knows Jesus. They've had a chance to hear uh, the, the truths of these last days. They've had a chance to meet Jesus. They've had a chance to uh, know the Bible. And they, uh, they just have rejected him. But what we're facing here in Bangkok is um, not that. That's not reality. That's not reality here in Bangkok. So, because how many people did you see at church uh, yesterday? Like 40. 40. That's cool because that is cool because that's a neighborhood uh, church plan. And those 40 people aren't driving an hour. They're walking to church. And did you, did you guys get a chance to go to someone someone's house? Um, we dropped a couple kids off on the way home. Right. But okay. we didn't really go in. All right. Yeah, you dropped them off. You just walked. And see, that's the whole point is that these church plants are being neighborhood and community based. And so it is that kind of saturation that we're wanting to do all across the city but many people say well, we're done there's 4,000 just to give you a reference there's over 4,000 7-elevens in the city basically there's either family mart or 7-eleven on Not every corner <laughs> right yeah. yeah okay but so our, our dream is to have that many church plants or that kind of saturation across the city. It's a lot of, do we have that many churches in America though? Um, that's a good question. So in the conference that I previously served, there was 100. And that covers uh, parts of three states. Uh, Eastern Washington, Northern Idaho, and the Northeast uh, corner of Oregon. Hmm. 
but even in those places, the number two uh, uh, largest city in Washington state, Spokane, only had 10, uh, approximately 10 churches in the metro area. And that's a city of half a million. Wow. So here we have seven established churches, 22 church plants in a city of 12 million. So is the job done? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> what are you eating? Oh, I have no idea what this is, but it's like an onion with a kiwi inside. So it tastes like an onion? No, 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 it tastes like a kiwi. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say. Yeah. So, but it do, looks do like wanna, an onion. Do you wanna know what it is? Yeah. This here is called dragon fruit. Really? And it comes from a cactus. I've seen it on the side of the road. Yeah. Uh, and it's really delicious. This here that one's pretty good. is what they call guava. That's guava? Yeah. This is guava. This, uh, this they call this farang. Or um, because it's white inside. I had that in Mexico and it tasted completely different. Yeah, it's a different variety. Nicole, I just wanted to ask you a question of that, you know, um, you were saying uh, earlier that, uh, what was she saying earlier? <laughs> <laughs> why are you here in, in Thailand? Uh, yeah, why, why are you here? Why'd you come? Why did I come? Because I was called here. I'm supposed yeah. to be here. That's right. Yeah. Right. I know there was a reason that God wants me here, so his work must not be done with Thailand yet. Yeah, right. But see, th th this is the problem, is that many people think in missions that we're done. That we have, you know, a couple, you know, satellite uh, TV station or TV programs uh, that are going around with, you know, sermons and English all around the world. I can remember one student missionary came to Bangkok and they were surprised that no one spoke English. <laughs> really? Yeah, because they, they, they got off the plane and they said to me that, um, you know, you know, Pastor Doug, I, I, you know, I came here to serve, and how come people don't speak English here? <laughs> and it was just, you know, part of that Shocked culture. Shocked that they have their own they, language. That's right. That's right. And or this assumption that you know we are that uh, the entire world uh, is uh, thinks that we uh, or how we think they uh, speak how we speak, they dress how we dress, they eat how we eat, and all these things. And so, but this is where. Um, as you're experiencing that that's not the case and so thus in communicating the gospel we also have to then um, uh, you know find ways that will connect to the people here how much did you raise to come here uh, I raised about about two thousand dollars okay all right and so you, by God's grace you'll be with us at least uh, <laughs> six months to yeah. Okay, yeah. six months to, or longer <laughs> is, is what we're praying. I don't have the ticket yet. Okay. So, so but, you know, and, but this is something where that, uh, according to some of the statistics that we found, is that even just you raising that funds to come over and to give a, you know, six months of your life for service to Christ, that this, um, you've outgiven, you know, the most Christians across uh, North America. Unfortunately, Pastor Doug is correct. The reality is that the average North American Adventist will give through the church about $820 per year in tithe and around $400 for the local church budget. Yet the same person will give only $21 a year for foreign missions. That's less than $2 a month or about 40 cents a week. At this rate, it will take 100 years of one person's average giving to foreign missions to equal the amount Nicole has raised for her half year of service. And you raised two thousand dollars to get yourself over here, and now you're going to see what the rest of the church has given because th that's the stuff that we work with. Is that you know we are the receiving end of the, those mission offerings, and now you'll get to see what that looks like. I find that really astonishing. Astonishing, but true. In the 1930s, if someone gave $10 in tithe, they would give a little less than $2 for the local church budget, but an additional $6 for foreign missions. Today, for every $10 given in tithe, another $5 is given for the local church budget, but only 28 cents is given to foreign missions. Let's look at the numbers. The average Adventist in 1933 gave about $311 for tithe in today's money and an additional $193 through the church toward foreign mission. 
In 2006, the standard of living is much higher, so we each give an average of about $820 a year in tithe, which is over two and a half times what was given in 1933. But when it comes to foreign missions, only about $21 per year is given, which is an 89% drop from what it used to be. Here's a graph showing the overall trend during the 73-year period. You can see that there's a huge increase in tithe due to the economic boom of the 20th century. Giving to the local church has also grown dramatically. However, something has gone dreadfully wrong with foreign mission giving. Instead of growing with the economy, it has steadily shrunk to the point where today our foreign mission program is statistically nearly extinct. And this downward trend still continues. Just how much money are we talking about here? Between 1933 and 2006, a total of $1.2 billion was given to foreign missions, while over $32 billion was given for tithe. If giving for foreign missions had continued at the same percentage of tithe that it was in 1933, $9.9 .9 billion would have gone into the work. What we're looking at here is an $8.7 billion shortfall. I find that really astonishing. I thought people gave more. Well, um, what can I say? <laughs> Thank you for giving. I don't just know people. That's what I've been, I've been taught like in Sabbath school and stuff that, that Jesus is coming any day because the word has been preached everywhere around the world. You're here in Thailand now. Is that the case? No. <laughs> Why? It's not. Because like Pastor Doug was saying, there's less than 1% has um, claimed Christ as their savior. And I mean, there's, there's, pl like, there's plenty that, I mean, sure they've, there may be people that have heard of him, but there's plenty that haven't even gotten that. Christian, he said that, yeah, it's good because every religion is teach the people to be a good people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay.
ดมีคนจะมาพูดหรือว่าจะมาพูดเกี่ยวกับเงาแบบนี้ให้น้องฟังน้องอยากจะรู้จักไหมคะอ the beautiful country of Thailand, 99.3% of the people do not consider themselves Christian. While less than 1% are Christian of any denomination, 96.2% are classified as unreached, which means that they haven't been exposed to the gospel in any form. So many uh, people are, are, are like satisfied with the way how church is, and that's um, and that's why I go back to the the 7-Eleven vision, is that we need to have that kind of saturation across the city, but that takes money. I mean, real estate here is the same price as you know uh, New York, uh, you know Seattle, um, and so this is where, or it might even be more expensive, but um, this is where to, you know, we're wrestling with those very issues of how are we finding you know ways to share the gospel to people like Sue, who you know we were able to go to her baptism yesterday. Amen. But it takes that community. Uh, community-based uh, church plant that's meeting needs and then living the gospel and then people are drawn to how Christ changes lives mm -hmm. and just like you saw and we witnessed yesterday uh, Kun Su mm -hmm. and her daughter. How long have you been here Nicole now? Now, wait, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, so weekend three days, so ten days. So ten days. Ten days. So uh, how many Christians have you seen? Oh wow. Um, Not very many. You know, even, many on, even the one girl that was with us on Sabbath was Buddhist. Yeah, yeah, she was Buddhist. We were at the temple and she was doing her rounds. She was Orally. definitely. Oh, wow. So even though you you r e already hanging out with Thai friends and you didn't even know that. I assumed she was Adventist, but apparently she wasn't. Right. And I and I think that that's the, the assumption that many people make is that around the world that you know they've um, that everyone around the world's already had a chance to hear the gospel. And um, you're going to, your eyes will be opened. I find that really hard to believe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, it's space. So I think Dong Xiao Babi Pap, yeah. I mean. The prison was completely changed into a safe place. And many prisoners. Were reformed and they were able to go back into the society. Now, what did he mean by saying this kindness to the prisoners? To God. And your, uh, you know, God used you as a tool to touch the lives of these people. And so, what, what did you see today, or what feelings do you have? Oh, I'm really excited to see seven people decided to join the church, mm. decided to follow Jesus all the way. Mm. We're so excited. Mm. It's not a sacrifice. This is. 
something I um, enjoy doing it. Praise God, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> yeah. Run to the heart that never changes. Run to the arms that are always near. Run and Lord to fall upon your saving grace. Your saving Today at this church plant, we witnessed an awesome scene where God is changing the lives of these precious Thai people. And if, if it wasn't for the fact that this church plant working in its local community, these people would not have had a chance to meet Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so it's so cool today as we saw that uh, when the one woman who had been a Thai lady was studying the Bible with our church planting team, and she attended these uh, meetings, and then her husband also had been studying with them. He also took his stand with his wife and that just broke my heart that God's grace even has, was working and being poured out on this family. And today we got to see this family come to Jesus Christ and take their stand together. And that just broke my heart. I'm just so excited about this fact that we had uh, what, what 17 people accept Jesus Christ. But jo Pastor Mok, uh, you know this city has 12 million people. Yes. So it, it, is this is a fruit of 17? Are, are you satisfied with this? <laughs> we are very happy and excited about people. You know accepted Jesus as the personal savior. We are happy, but we. Look, comparing with the population of this city, of course we are not satisfied. We want as many of them come in to the church as possible. Yeah.